Okay. Thanks, Rob. Yes. Can you get people started with the Nasumi one since I hang out? And can you please go make sure it's recording? Yeah, sure. Okay, everyone. We're going to do the administrative announcements. Are we recording? Good? Okay. So, I was watching. Uh, the first thing is, just you know, I posted the first two lectures and also the first SOLIDWORKS training. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely a learning process. So, I finally realized why only those of you in the front row seem to be nodding in assent with the derivation last week because you couldn't see it. I was writing down there, among other things, and you couldn't hear it. So, uh, we, they're posted. Feel free to watch them. They're not the best videos ever. but So, um, this is CS235, Applied Robot Design for Non-Robot Designers. And looking at the lab, it looked like uh, you're going to be needing to know how to tap holes, drill holes, ream holes, chamfer holes, deburr edges, and some of you don't know how to do this. So um, we're going to be doing that straight away. My lovely assistants, please stand up. We have Sonny, Mike, and Brian. They're sitting up in their hearts, I assure you. So um, let's just go ahead and jump right in. Don't mind me. Okay, so, um, <laughs> The first thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be chamfering. <laughs> and then we're going to be tapping. This is compressed air for you all. What's, what's funny? Why not? So, you should know when someone is wearing a gas mask, they're wearing it for a reason. This should make you very uncomfortable. At first, it's a little funny, but once your eyes start burning, it will no longer be funny. Can everyone understand what I'm saying? So about 15 minutes ago, when I walked into the room when I was wearing a gas mask, did not put one on, and quickly ran back out with his eyes watering and burning. And it occurred to me that people do not have enough of a respect for the fact that this looks freaky. This is mustard gas grade. So anytime you see me wearing this gas mask or anyone anywhere in the universe wearing a gas mask, do not enter the room without first understanding why they're wearing said mask. Because I don't wear it for fun. I actually hate this thing. It's very hot and sweaty. And I'm wearing it because Delrin is really bad for you and it burns your eyes quite bitterly. So that's why you all have these. Um, but that, that is to illustrate. We really do work with some nasty stuff. You need to make sure you're, you're equipped for it. So everybody go ahead, stand up. We're going to be forming an assembly line. We're going to be assembling iPads today. <laughs> Please no mass strikes or threats of suicide. Okay, quick announcement. Rob, can you hand up that giant tome? Rob there has the yellow Bible. It is not a spray-painted King James. It is the uh, parts list of Misumi. So, um, on Thursday night, we're going to be hearing a talk from these guys. I'll explain more later uh, once our assistants aren't waiting on us. Before you sit down, after you've done all of this, the boxes are full of these. Please make sure to get one so that I don't have to hand them out. Um, I'll just put this one here. Okay, so I'm not trying to be mean. I only have enough parts for those who are officially enrolled. If you're not officially enrolled, please don't come. You're welcome to watch. First thing you do, grab one of these and put it on. I can hear you speak with them. That's fine. Um, you pinch these little things. So you put it on like this. Okay. And then you pinch this so it's snug over your nose. Get one of these. Get one of these. I don't have AIDS. It's fine. Then uh, come over here, and uh, Sonny, you're with me. Brian, you're uh, over here, and Mike, you're at the very end. So before you guys actually do this, I'm going to show you how to do it. But by having you stand up. By having you stand up, we're able to uh, have you see everything a bit clearer. Am I still live? I think so. Okay. 
Anybody know what material this is? Yes. This is Delrin. It's a plastic. It's an excellent plastic. It's very strong. Uh, it smells bad, but it is very strong. Okay. So, um, actually, can you guys pass those back so everyone has one in their hand? As you're all grabbing this, I'm going to start explaining it real quick. And by the way, we won't be doing this all quarter, the whole getting up and everything, but this is like the bare bones basics to do anything for building stuff. So, flip it. You see how there's one side that looks a little bit melty and it's got two uh, orthogonal lines on it? Flip it opposite that. And run uh, the pad of your index finger over the holes and tell me what you feel. A little bit of a burr. When the laser cut cuts it, it leaves a little bit of a melty burr. So if we, were, if we were trying to mount this flat against an aluminum plate, that would be bad because it wouldn't be flat, right? First thing you always do, sand. Never, ever, ever let us catch you sanding without at least one of these. You don't want lung cancer or whatever else it'll give you. But you're, you're okay from there. It's not like a toxic dust cloud, but when you come up here. So you take this. Take your sandpaper. Lightly, circles. This isn't like real hard, just a little bit. And you'll be able to see around the edges, the burrs. You see where it's sanding. You flip it. Cool. Then, just a little to get it off. Burrs are gone. Now, we have, we have four holes here. A big central one. That is for an 8 millimeter shaft. I intentionally cut it too small. It's for 7.9 millimeters. The other three are 3.3 millimeters, and we're going to be putting M4 screws in it. Does anyone know why it's a 3.3 millimeter hole? When you tap something, does anyone know what tapping is? Tapping, this is the tap, puts threads into a hole. You can't put a screw into a hole without threads in it. The threads mate. You can't just tap directly into a plate without first having a hole, and each screw has a drill size for it. For M4, three point three millimeters. We have three of these holes. I don't want you to touch uh, touch two of them. Don't touch the other. We're going to leave one just so you can see later what it looked like al natural. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, chamfer it. Anyone remember why? So we can stick shafts in it. This is the chamfer. You don't have to go super fast on this or apply much pressure. Basically, you're going to stick the hole up like this, right angle, and you'll see a little cone forms around the edge. Only do that to two of them, back and front. Okay. Now, we're going to be using some special screws. So what I want you to do is clamp this. Once you've put in your chamfers, clamp this here. A while, and I want you to press really hard on just one side of one hole. Use one hand to hold it, align it, press the button, and one hand on the back is pressure. You should be going fairly deep. Don't. Uh, you should be going fairly deep. Don't go too too deep, but I want it much more than the other chamfer. Once you've done that. Come to the next station. We'll have people along the way showing you how to do this. This is a tap. Sometimes you have to do it by hand. Sometimes you can do it with this. It's material and size dependent. We'll be going over that after you've done it. Take your part. You see these two wings? These are to help you resist the torques of when you're doing this. So kind of grab it in your fingers like this. See? Okay. Put this up to the hole. Now when you press this, if you barely press it, it goes real slow. See how it's barely moving? If you go fast, don't do that. Really slow. Start out before you even try to tap real slow. Okay. Which direction should I be going? Anybody know? These are standard screws. Right hand. Take your right hand to get your thumb that way. Right handed. Now to get it out, there's a button on here. Press it the other way. Reverse. Make sure, before you stick this in the hole, 
Turn it slowly and make sure it's going clockwise. Okay, you blow it off. Put these over here too. Now, anybody know what this is? Other than a dagger for a vampire. This is a center punch. Can you drill or should you drill directly into a plate? Just take the drill and drill. Why not? It will wander. This, when you do this, you press real hard until you hear that noise. It's putting a little dimple, a little cone in there. That gives the drill bit somewhere to start. So what I want you to do, everybody find the two orthogonal lines barely visible. You're going to put this center punch directly at the intersection of those lines. Hold it flat here, straight up and down. Now you have a starting point for your drill. Okay. Uh, now once we do it, I'm going to switch this up a little bit. You take this drill here. We're going to clamp this part here on one of the little wings. Anybody know why we're doing this before we drill? Yeah, if you just hold it, it will likely break free and these are sharp enough it'll cut your finger very deeply. Take this, put the tip in that little cone we just made. Make sure it's lined up, straight up and down. I want you to drill all the way through the plywood. We're going to use that hole too later. Okay, so now I've got two holes. This is a tap, but it's not on a drill bit. This is a hand tap. You can do the exact same thing, only you're not going to have the advantage or the alacrity of doing it with a drill. You just do this. Now when you tap, these are tapered taps. If you only go a few turns, it won't be doing much. I want you to go until there are about four uh, threads left on the tap from the back. Don't go too far or you'll break the part and the tap. Okay. Now you rotate this the other way, and you're good. So at this point, we have one hole with nothing that's happened to it, one hole that's been power tapped, one hole that's been hand tapped, and that we drilled. Okay, we're almost there. This is a power screwdriver. I want you all to take one each of these screws in the boxes of screws and hold on to them for the rest of the lecture. Take one of these small ones, the small M4 ones, put it here. Now this hole does not have threads, but it's wood. It's very soft. We're going to be doing what's called self-tapping. For extremely soft non-plastics, such as wood, basically only wood, if you just put the screw there, apply a little bit of pressure, and start spinning, it goes all the way in. You don't have to put it all the way in, just enough to realize, like make it go through the board, but not too far try to pull out and you realize you can't get it out. Reverse the button and you're done. Okay, that's it. Oh, when you go also take one of these lock washers and the flat washers with you. Okay, so to review, there are a couple different stations. There, there are several of them right here. We're going to go one by one and let's start. Any questions? You're not screwing anything into this? We are. Those are what the screws are for before you go. So take one of each of the screws in that box. Oh, this one has little tiny screws. Hey, what um, yeah. about the reamer? Oh, I didn't show you the reamer. Thanks. Anyone know what a reamer does? This level is just a little more. Drills are not precise. Reamers are. If you want to finish a hole to a very precise diameter, you always use a reamer. It doesn't take large chunks. You don't want to do a 7 millimeter hole and ream to 8. You want to take a 7.9 millimeter hole and ream to 8. So you're going to hold it up like this. This is again very slow. It kind of self aligns due to the compliance of your arms. Start it spinning. Put it in the middle of the hole. Everybody see? Going through. Do not stop. Pull it backwards while still spinning. Okay, that's the reamer. And then the sanity check for why the hell did we do that is somewhere around here. Well, uh, oh, I moved it. Damn it. Rob is going to locate for us the. Uh, there's a. Um, 
is a very precise dowel. I'll find it. Uh, by, by the time you get to the end, just stick the dowel in here and you'll be done. Any questions about this? Other than am I crazy? The answer is no. Or maybe. Uh, right. <laughs> yep. no. This is the dowel. This dowel will not fit. You don't even need to try. I can already tell you. It's nowhere near close. By the end, when you fit it in the hole, with a little bit of pressure, it should be a slip fit. I'm going to put this right here. Sonny? No. George, uh, Mike, you're right here. Sonny, you're right here. All right. Brian, you're right here with the reamer and the center punch. All right, everybody come through. Could I take away this center punch? Oh, if you have crap left in the holes, push it out with your fingers and put it in your pocket. Don't leave it. Okay. So everybody come through. Go ahead and stand lightly. Dust mask on by the time you're up here. Hey, Rob. Yeah. Could you please get the video camera and just record what we're doing along the way? Is that good? That's good. The other side. The other side. Other side. But we just didn't see the cross. Okay. So you got the sanding and the chamfering. Okay. Uh, okay. Now chamfer. You start from going from here now. And this, the small. Yep. Hole. Just the small holes. <laughs> You could, this one goes fast. Uh -huh. It's good. Just go ahead. So I should just uh -huh. straight up and down. That's good enough. Okay. See that took away the material. See just a little bit. You guys can inspect your parts later, but trust me, it just a little bit gets it, and then leave the other one alone. Okay. Yep. Now flip it over and do that one. And that one do a lot harder. Yeah, I'll help hold you. Go ahead. More, more, more. Keep going. Fast. 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 Yeah. Okay. A little more. What? A little more. Why is Harder. That guy hard? Harder. Harder. You like it, huh? Oh, yeah. You like that? Okay. We're good. Spray it off. Oh, All right. It's all funny until I'm expelled. Okay, go ahead and tap. Only the two holes that you just chamfered. Okay? Two holes next to each other. Okay, go ahead. Circle motions. Circle. And I do that here. No, no, hold it up in the air. And hold it like this. Okay. Orthogonal to the hole. Yep. Start out slow. Same two holes on the other side. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Okay. You're not quite orthogonal. Straighten out. Keep going. You're good. You're good. Just don't hold it quite so tightly. A little faster. A little faster. One more. No, no. Continuous. Keep it on. Oh yeah, it looks like clamp for. The clamp is for clamping it. Uh huh. And then backwards. Yeah, and then backwards. Good enough. Okay, yep. Okay, next. Do you do two holes? Actually, on, sorry, only... Yeah, you're good. You're good. Okay, don't, don't tap the other one. Okay, Shruti. Okay, just one hole. Just tap one of them, one of the chamfered ones. Come over here, center punch in the middle of the orthogonal lines. All right, Brian, you're center punch guy. Okay, and I do that one most of the way. Uh, no, hold it. Hold it between your fingers like, like this. That way you can resist torques. Awesome, perfect. Okay, yeah, you're good. Here, or line it like this. And now turn on. Other, other way. Okay. See? You've got to be right handed. Perfect. Just keep doing that. A little faster. You feel how it's sucking you in. Okay. Keep going. This is a challenge. Keep going. And now press the reverse button. Yep. And reverse out. Perfect. Okay. Now spray off. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay. Take one of your chamfered holes. Yep. Not that. Well, it doesn't matter which one. Just make sure it's chamfered. Okay. And go ahead. 
Oh, yep, just like that, perfect. Orthogonal, slowly. Nope, wrong direction. Okay. Strong guy. Okay. Not, not too much, not too much. Okay, you're good. Okay, faster. All right, and now reverse. All right, and now reverse the drill for me. You're good. Next. Okay. Okay, so. One, uh, one of your chamfered holes. Did you chamfer any of the other? Okay. And go ahead and stick it orthogonal. You want to hold this between your fingers like this. Okay. 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 And now stick it there and press a little faster. Okay. Now reverse the drill. Okay. Well done. Okay, everybody, make, pay more uh, attention to um, making the drill at a right angle to the plate. Um, it, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it'll, it'll help you in the end. All right, next. Cool. Hey, how are, do, how are we down there with everything? And Mike, are you having them self-tap the wood? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, uh, just, just one of the ones that you chamfered. Doesn't matter which one. Here, hold the plate like this. Okay. Is that okay? And just start out slow until you get the feel for it. A little faster. Perfect. Now you're going to go until you're just about the end. Not, uh, you need to go a little, well, you got it, okay. Next time go a little further, but you're good. And then a little deeper? Yeah. Perfect. Cool, cool. Uh-huh. All right. So this you can't self-tap? No, I tried earlier. <laughs> Failed miserably. Okay, go ahead and pick one of the holes you just chamfered. Uh-huh. And then, uh... And ream just... For this one? Uh, to tap, oh, yeah. tap, yeah. Let's do the other one for this one. Okay. Yep. Not the deep one? Now, uh, you see, you're not quite orthogonal. Yeah. Yep. Uh, get, get the tap. And I want it... Okay. Uh, can I see? Oh. Slowly. Okay. Yeah, okay. Put it in the hole before you turn it on. Yeah. And slowly. A little faster. Perfect. You can feel the torque positioning here. Yep. Alright, and go until almost the very end. Alright, and now reverse the drill. And you're good. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, you're perfect. Alright. We had to do a hand tap on brass one time and it was yeah. so yeah. painful. Yeah. What's up? If, they, if, if it's a little bit not at a right angle, then um, should, they it, should they do it again? Or Did you ream? Yeah, this is after ream. Yeah, try, try reaming uh, at a right angle. Hey, everybody. If you don't hold your plate at a right angle, your shaft will be in at a weird angle. Really try to get it at a 90 degree angle. You also may have gotten screwed by the laser cutter. What's it? Oh. All right, and then pull out. Okay, so hold it like this, okay? Take one of the holes you just chamfered. Put this in the hole before you start rotating. And then you want to start out real slow. Nope, that's not orthogonal. Here you go. Right there, start. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. So just reaming the big one? Yeah. Uh, hold on one sec. Go a little further. A little further. More. And then reverse. Okay. So. Nice and. Nice and slow. Nice and orthogonal. Yep. And don't stop the drill until you're reversed out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. All right, you're good. Going in the same direction? Yeah. You, oh, you don't have to reverse out? No. Nah. Okay, you just pull it out. The act of reversing might uh, kind of kink the center. Oh, yeah, because it only cuts one direction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is this cold enough? Oh, yeah, it's perfect. Okay. So, um, put this in one of your chamfered holes before you turn it on. Yeah. You want to hold it like this. Yeah. Okay. And then put it in one of the holes before you start the drill. Two months. Good. Yeah, just like three or four turns is enough. Oh, You're just getting rid of a tiny little bit of plastic. Right here. Remember, only do two of your holes. 
Okay. We good? So Keep going. So both of them are um, tough? Uh, uh, no, just one. And this one should be. A little faster? Perfect. Now go until you're almost uh, through the threads. Oh god, I think it's no. more than that. It's okay. Here, let me help you. Wait. Here, can I show you? The table isn't 90 degrees. By the time that you're done, alright, now reverse out. Yeah. Press the button here. A little faster. Perfect. Great. All right. Yeah. I've gone through one cycle. Should I just turn it off? And, uh... <laughs> no, let's just keep going through the cycles. See more students. Awesome. Okay. So you're going to hold your part like this. You're going to put the drill in one of the chamfered holes before you turn it on and just turn slowly. Okay. And try, try to eyeball it to make sure it's 90 degrees. Is anybody waiting here for the center punch? Okay. Go ahead. Remember. <laughs> All the way. All the way. Oh, uh, oh, very not 90 degrees. Okay. Like that? Yeah. Okay. And Rob, if you see people who need help, feel free to. Okay, a little faster. And now press reverse. Okay. You can go fast for reverse. All right. Perfect. See how it's important to align it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, make sure it's clockwise. Press the drill. See, got to reverse it. Okay. Now uh, put it in the hole before you turn it on. Probably hold it like this to resist torques. And then you want to... Um, yeah. You want to make sure you're at a 90 degree. So this is all you didn't do, and this is all you did. Okay, go ahead. Yep, yep. Perfect. There you go. You can test the little rod. Yep. Oops. Okay, a little, little faster. A little more. Yeah, uh, until the end of the tap. This is uh, tapered, so you gotta go quite far. Keep going. I'll make this faster. There you go. Until we've got about four threads left, and then you reverse. All right, go ahead and reverse. Remember, 90 degrees. You're good. I'm just reminding you. I should have said, good job. Remember, 90 degrees. And then uh, try not to stop the drill when you're pulling out. All right, now try fitting in this. If you stop these uh, orthogonal uh, cutting surfaces, will make a cut into the surface. And then burr. Yeah, you get a little burr on the side along the axis. See? What a nice fit. You reamed it. <laughs> That's okay. The 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 dowel isn't perfectly flat, so when it laser cuts, it laser cuts at an angle. No, do the fact that when you buy dowel, it's all warped. Okay, ready? So you're gonna hold it like this. This in your left, in your other hand. Put put this in the tip in the hole before you turn it on. Which ones? Uh, one of the chamfered ones. Okay. And nice and slow, 90 degrees. You wanna kind of. There you go. Try to let it, it. You don't have to hold it too rigidly. Let it self-align. It wants to go in a certain direction for plastic. Okay. A little faster. There you go. Until just about the end, and then stop and reverse. All right, stop, reverse. And how do I reverse? Uh, the button. This one? Uh-huh. All the way. Okay. All right, and now pull out without stopping. Perfect. So we do the other And now you can blow it off and test that shaft. So it's just one hole, same yeah. speed, but just more. Oh, actually, is that right? For the hand tap, it's a big chamfered hole. Is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, by the end, you should have one power tapped hole and one hand tapped hole. Okay, so also, this is my singing voice, the pinched nose. Okay. So go ahead. Yep, exactly. Put the tip before you start it. 
Kind of slowly make, yep, you're lined up. Mm -hmm. Perfect. You're a natural. Go until about you've got four left. Yeah. Particularly hand tapping is pretty hard. All right. Are those power traps? Can uh -huh. you do it through metal? No. <laughs> Very bad idea. You need like a melon. But in practice, people will have you do that. We'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> They'll make you do it. Okay. Who's waiting on what? When you've got to do like okay. 10,000 of them. So go ahead and, and hold it at a nice orthogonal angle. <laughs> Only one direction, don't reverse. And keep it running as you reverse. Yeah. 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 A little faster. Okay, and now pull back without stopping. Cool. And now test with the shaft. Okay, next for the tap. Okay. So, yep, go ahead and put it in one of the holes you chamfered. So either one? Yeah, before you, um, and then you'll hand tap the other. You got what? It's okay. The metal will break off after what? a while. Power tap? Pretty good fit. Okay, thank you. It, it should be a, you know, a slip, a squeeze. Particularly because of plastic. It's really hard to get the same type of fit in plastic because sometimes rather than cutting it just pushes and then it comes back. A little faster? <laughs> yeah, you're good. A little faster? Perfect. And then go until just about the end. Okay, hold it at 90 degree. Start, and kind of you'll feel want to go in. That's good. And then you're going to go about half an inch in. Make sure it sticks a little faster. All the way in. And now we're and now pull out with it on. Just don't stop the drill. Okay. And now test by putting that shaft in there. It should be a, you know, you should have to put a little bit of pressure and it'll just go in. Yep. Oh, that that's the feel of a reamed hole. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we're good. We're about halfway through. And everyone's wearing the dust masks. Excellent. Probably not. Hmm. Looks like there's just a bit of like threads in there. Is that you? Yeah, look closely and you'll see the threads. Oh yeah, you have to blow them out. All right, next for the tap. So um, go ahead and put it the tip in the hole. You want to hold it like this to resist torques. So it's on the two, the two holes that we have. Yeah, just just power tap one, and the other you'll hand tap. Okay, make sure uh, you're not quite aligned. Move, move the drill down a little bit. Perfect, right there. Okay, excellent, excellent. You're a natural at this, and it's it's on, right? Okay, stop and reverse. Everybody's picking up their screws as they leave, right? Perfect. And now you can see their threads in there. Okay. Is anybody reading, waiting to ream? No. I am. You are? Okay. So, go ahead, Brian. All right. So, you're going to hold it like this. Okay. Okay. Just to resist torques, put the tip of this in one of your chamfered holes. Make sure you're lined up at 90 degrees. Yep. And now go slowly. Now you're not quite aligned. Uh, here. There. Perfect. Okay. Now go ahead and start. Slowly. You're not quite aligned, buddy. There. Go ahead. All right. A little faster. There. Okay. Now go all the way, almost until the end. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Okay, and now reverse. All you need is about three or four guys. No, for, yeah, well, it's for the screw at the end. Do that for the other one? It's a secret! No, no, not in the air. Some of these are cool air things. Some of them will cut your hand off, some of them won't work. 
Yep. Just press it. Just press it. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, no, just one. You did one, right? Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah, two holes. Yeah, two holes. Mm -hmm. Just do deep on one. Okay, next for tapping. Okay, you're going to hold it like this. You're going to put the tip of this in one of your chamfered holes before you start the drill. Line it up to be 90 degrees as close as you can. Uh, good enough. Okay, go ahead and start slow. And let your, don't hold it too rigidly. Let your hands kind of self-align. Um, so you want to keep it going as you go in. It's going pretty well. All right, and now reverse. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, now pull backwards. Perfect. Now put the shaft in there. Well done. Okay, so you're going to hold it like this to resist torques, and then put the tip of this in one of your chamfered holes. Line up 90 degrees before you start it. Don't hold too rigidly. Okay, and now slowly. A little faster. Perfect. Go almost until the end. Stop and reverse. Perfect. Natural. Okay. Ready? Yep. So hold it uh, with your fingers on the bars to resist torques. Put the tip in one of the chamfered holes, 90 degrees. Doesn't matter which ones. Nope, just pick two. Okay. Kind of start, start slow. Go into almost the end, the last couple of threads, and then reverse. How are we doing? Uh, hand tap is the, the bottle. The bottle nut, yeah, I feared that. Strip it going, come back to a little hole. Okay, good. Yeah, just want to move a little bit, right? Yeah. Okay. You want me to clean the table? Nah, it's okay. All right, go ahead and hit reverse. Okay, guys, we're uh, we're happy you're here. Please only come if you're enrolled. We only have uh, enough parts for enrolled students. If you're auditing, you can watch, but we don't have parts for you. Perfect. This thing you cannot 3D print, right? This is too strong. No. This thing just comes in a plate and uh -huh. cut it out. Right? And we will, we'll talk about that later. But yeah, that's why we're use, that's why we're having to do this post processing. Okay. Delrin's nice stout plastic. Okay, who here uh, is waiting to ream and center punch? Okay. Go ahead and put this in between at the intersection of the two lines on the table, straight up and down. Okay, and press down hard. Perfect. Okay, he's ready to ream. So uh, line it 90 degrees, kind of loose arms, let itself align. Nope, no, 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 no. Never hold by the tip like that because it'll just slip out. Okay. Like oh. this. Okay. And then you want to turn this on before you put it in the hole. Let itself align. Do not turn it off. You're gonna pull. Once you're through, pull out without. Yeah. All the way through. A little faster on the drill. And now pull back. Perfect. Now test it with the shaft in here. Here, can I get in here? What's up? Do this one just lightly. Just a few rotations. That That's more than enough. This all the way through, right? Yeah. Okay, keep going. A little faster. Perfect. Go all the way until the end. Now stop, hit the reverse button on the drill, and back out. Squeeze. Okay, who here is waiting to center punch? Put the tip in the middle of the intersection of the lines. So why doesn't screw do its own threads? Because uh, this is too hard of a material. So the drill is specially hardened material? Or yes, the, the tap. The it's tap it's really hard. sharp. If you okay. you can prick your fingers with it, okay. and it's specially hardened, it's actually special coated to not wear down. Okay. Really, the only material I've ever self tapped is wood. Hey, Michelle, support the the. You're going the wrong direction and support it with your fingers. It's not going to hurt you, but if you don't support it, it'll just fall over and rip out the threads. Okay, who here is waiting to center punch?
Okay. In the cent intersection of the two lines, press down until you hear the snap and make sure you're, you're orthogonal. Do I need this one? Or? Nah, I just put it there just in case. If anybody gets out of line, I can just cut them. <laughs> okay. okay. And, and don't turn off. Now pull the drill out. And Perfect. Now stick this in just to test it's a good fit. So on this side? In the intersection. And you have to do it on the table. So you didn't do the holes, on, uh, you didn't do the edges on this one, right? Yeah, we've got one down there. We forgot to do it. But I guess the plastic is so soft it's going to go up anyway, or is it because of this tool? That uh, the, the, the reamer is getting rid of most of the burr. Okay. That's a bit not really. That's fine. Okay. All right, who's waiting to tap? Hey, buddy. Okay. Can you see this, uh, Jonas? Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we got two more minutes. If you're not done in two minutes, you'll have to do it after class. Yeah. Um, who was supposed to sign up for times this week? Not yet. I'll go over that. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm going to start talking because otherwise we won't get to anything today. So I'm just going to go briefly, everybody? Ready? Okay, so I'm going to go over briefly what we just did. Um, so the first thing is when you get parts, and this isn't just laser cut, are you good, Rob? You're recording? Okay, so when you get parts, and these aren't just laser cut parts, these are any parts, um, usually people aren't that careful and they come with burrs on them. Remember when you sanded those little things that felt a little rough? Those are burrs. This is material that is clinging to dear life but shouldn't be there. It doesn't work well for Delrin, but it works really well for aluminum and steel. We'll go over that another time. So the first thing is we just got rid of burrs. The reason being, if you have burrs, nothing fits. Holes don't go in shafts with burrs. Plates don't uh, um, screw, screw down flat if they have burrs. And also, somewhere in here, we had air to get rid of uh, any little bits of material that got trapped in there. The next thing we did was we chamfered. Another word for this is countersink. Now, sort of the difference between, so this chamfer is where we had, this was a square hole, and then we cut off these corners here. And it only took a few turns to do that in plastic. For aluminum, it takes more. For steel, even more. But for plastic, it's pretty easy. Um, so, uh, countersinking, let's go ahead and tell you why. Everybody take out the large conical screw you have. You have two, hopefully. And if you only have one, just look at the conical screw in front of you. Everybody got one? Okay, so that fits in the hole with the giant chamfer. Because if you wish to have the screw screw into that hole and not have the screw head poking out, then you have to make a conical hole in there. So you should know that there's a difference in that cone angle between um, metric and US. 
I don't remember what it is for US. I think it's something random like 84 degrees or something. Guess what it is for metric? 90. It's 90. Another reason why we're going with metric. It's easy. So chamfering is a general term for just sort of doing a, the little chamfer. If you're doing a big, big, big chamfer so that you could inset a flat screw like that, then it's called countersinking. And I just said flat screw. Those are called flat screws. I don't know why, because well, I guess because they lie flat against the material. Okay. Now you should have another screw there that doesn't have a conical section. It just has sort of a right circular cylinder. That's just a regular screw. And there are different flavors of that. They might be larger diameter. They might be hexagonal. They might be um, a little thinner than usual. The ones that I showed you are hex. These are called um, socket, he uh, socket head screws. And this little hex here, that's for an Allen key. So this is socket head, AKA hex, although hex sometimes means something different. And you want an Allen key, you know those little L-shaped things? Now, I'm going to draw something different on top of this in a different color. Sometimes you'll come across something called Torx. Okay, in the red. Anybody tell me what the difference is uh, intended for? Fingers to screw them? Huh? You use fingers to screw them? No. This takes higher torque. They don't strip as easily. So um, if you look on your, if you have a fairly uh, recent laptop, you might have one of these holding it together towards the screen. They're called ultra low head Torx screws. They're super thin. The ones from Masumi, if you look at them, if that's the head. <coughs> The head is only like 0.8 millimeters thick. It's really thin. And they inset this torx into it. And because torx can carry more torque because it has these little protrusions, that's why they use torx there. Real quick, uh, so uh, let's go through a few more things and then I'll come back to screws, okay? Power tapped. <coughs> Tapping. Holes don't come threaded. Holes come as holes. You don't tap into a block of material without a hole first. You don't put a random hole. If it's an M3, you don't use a 3 millimeter drill. You use a, you look it up. So real quick, in this class we will use M2s, M3s, 4, 5, 6, and what? 8, 10, 4, 15. There's no M7, oh, there is an M7. It basically doesn't exist. If you can buy one for me by the end of the quarter, I'll be impressed. It skips for some reason. There's also an M1.6. This sucks. Don't use it unless you have to. This is only if someone, if you're doing a special micro um, application, fine. You know, you're going to hate your life. If someone gives you an, uh, something that plugs in and it already has these, you have to. This is basically the smallest you're ever going to use, M2. These tap really easily. <laughs> really easy, uh, or, or strip really easily. You know what I mean by strip? That means when you turn that Allen key, it cuts off the hex and makes a circle. It rips the corners out of the steel on the screw. And it becomes a circle and then it no longer works. It's just if you put too much torque. Remember when I said this, this Allen key, there's the short side and the long side? This is why, especially for M2s, you only ever use the little side so you apply less torque. You will strip M2s in this class, but I won't give you that many opportunities because it's, it's just annoying. M3s, those are, still pretty, those, those are still pretty easy to strip. So let's make a little table here. This is on a scale of 1 to 10. This is 10. This is an 8. Likely, if you're not careful, especially if you're using a power, do not use power screwdrivers on M2 or M3. You'll strip them. M4, it's pretty low. M5, 6, and 8 
Unless you're using pneumatic tools, you're not going to strip. So if you're doing something like building a table, you want M5 or above probably. Everything I build for this class, I try to do M4s because they don't strip easily, but they're not huge. Now, what is the outside? Let's draw a screw here. Um, and for now, I'm going to put this up. Can everyone see even with this blue light? Okay. Let's draw a screw. So this is the head. Sometimes it will be a flat screw like that. And that's a 45 degree angle for metric. In here, that will be the socket. And that will be either hex or torx. What's torx? Flower power. It's the flower thingy. Okay, then you're gonna have some threads. Everyone should have a really long screw. Tell me something obvious about it. It's only partially threaded. There aren't threads along the whole thing. Now look at some of the shorter screws. They're all fully threaded. When you buy a screw, it's important to know, is it partially or fully threaded? This matters because if you're trying to have a plate come all the way up to here and you've threaded the plate for the entire screw, this can't go in it. So if we put a plate right here, the hole has to be uh, threaded for the entire section. What is this diameter? So this is the outside diameter, the OD. What is the outside diameter for an M2? Millimeters. Two millimeters. How about for an M5? Five millimeters. Whatever after the two, the M is, is the outside diameter of the screw. Okay. Now let's zoom in here. Uh, this is called the pitch, P, of the screw. So, I'm going to write some things out here. We've got an M3 by 0.5 millimeter. M4 by 0.7 millimeter, M5, I think it's by, I don't remember, M6 by 1 millimeter, M8 by 1.25 millimeter. Let's look up an M5 real quick. Um, so what are those numbers? 0.8. What are these numbers on the right here? They're the pitch. The pitch is the linear distance it takes one thread to make one revolution. So if I were to draw a giant helix and I start here on the back side, that distance, as terrible as this drawing is, is the pitch. So what does this mean if I have a 20 millimeter long screw, an M8, and I have a 20 millimeter long screw, an M3, which one will have more threads? M3. It's much smaller pitch. Now, um, it's nice to have as many threads engaged. Engaged means screwed in. So if you have a hole and it has, it's uh, say 8 millimeters thick, and you have a screw all the way in, it's engaged over eight millimeters. It doesn't have to be that way. It can have partial engagement. Really, most, I don't remember the, the statistic, but basically, the first three to four threads of your screw take most of the load. You want at least four threads. In a soft material, you want way more than that. That's like for aluminum and steel. For Delrin, you want to you, you wanna be going for, you know, 10 threads if you can, because it's soft. You mean 10 yeah, 10 uh, f first threads engaged. Now, uh, coming over here, you told me the outside diameter was 2, and 3, 4, 5, 6, and 8. This is called the tap 
drill size is what? Remember when we power drilled, why did we power drill? Before you tapped it. So first, I gave you a 3.3 millimeter hole and you power tapped it. Then I had you drill a hole that was 3.3 millimeters and then you hand tapped it. Why did you drill that hole? So that way you could hand tap through dollar inch. Exactly. And it wasn't a random size. Each of these has a tap drill size, which means if you want to put an M3 screw tapped into that plate, first you drill a hole of the tap drill size. 1.6 millimeters, 2.5 millimeters, 3.3 millimeters, 4.2 millimeters, 5 millimeters. I don't remember what that one is. M8s are like for building elephant handling, handling equipment. I mean, it's, I'd be surprised if you're using M8s anytime soon. <coughs> so, um, basically, once we got rid of the burrs and we chamfered to uh, and countersunk, then we power tapped. Power tapping and hand tapping are the same thing, just one is faster. You can only power tap uh, in soft materials safely. I mean, you can, in like, say, aluminum, you'll break taps, especially as you're starting out. Only power tap for M4 and above. M3 and M2, you have to hand tap or you will break it. If you're trying to do M2 into steel, God help you. You really want a professional to be doing that. Once you break a tap in there, say you got halfway through and your tap broke in half, which by the way I'm proud of none of you broke it, you can't get it out half, you know, three quarters of the time. It's wasted. You dremel it off and then you're missing a hole. This is like the bane of everyone's existence. Be real careful tapping M2. M3 as well, but especially M2. Try not to do it unless you absolutely have to. So you hand tap and you'll notice uh, so put your, uh, everyone should have a screw started in one of your tap holes. Is there anyone here, please raise your hand, if it doesn't look perfectly 90 degrees to the face. You're truthful, the rest of you are liars. I bet you not a single person has something that looks perfectly 90 degrees if you really squint. Screws are not precision instruments unless they're like microscope screws in which the pitch is something ridiculous, like really, really tiny. You don't use screws to ensure perpendicularity. You don't use them to ensure position between two plates. You only use screws to give an axial force between two things. So say I had two plates, okay, and I want to put these two plates together. So this is plate one, and this is plate two. And these are three millimeter dowel holes. By the way, the nature of this lecture has to be fragmented. I'm, I'm not schizophrenic, it, you'll see at the end. Um, these are dowel holes. These are press fit, basically. They're very precise. So these will be down to the micron level, you know, probably like 13 microns. Do dowel pins provide an axial force to keep these two plates together? So we're going to put them together like this, sandwich one together like this. So then we'll have one dowel pin like this and one dowel pin like this. Is there anything to keep these two plates from coming apart other than just a little pressure from the press foot? Would you want to build a medical robot where you're just relying on a little bit of friction to hold it together? No, you need screws. So let's put two bigger screws. So these are two tapped and I'll, I'll that, that little squiggle will mean threads. Should these, what size should these be? Let's call these M4. So this is going to be 3.3 millimeter. Why? It's the trap drill size. What size should these two be? No. Four millimeters is the nominal outside diameter of a screw. There's probably a Gaussian distribution in terms of the actual diameter of that screw. If you make a four millimeter hole for four millimeter screw, some sizable percentage of the time your screw will not fit through there. There is a standard chart. If you Google 
and I will Google right now for us. Uh, actually, I have a book. I use this like 20 times a day because I just, after a while, you just can't remember that many numbers. Um, I know this is kind of hard. I'll pull it down for a sec. Okay. So this is basically close is you don't want much clearance for the screw and we get bigger and bigger. So for an M4, we want anywhere from 4.3 millimeters to 4.8 millimeters so that we're guaranteed our screw fits with no problems. Also keep in mind when you machine things, it's not perfect. You think those holes are at perfect locations, they're not. So even if you had, say, a 4.3 millimeter hole, but then that hole is scooched a little left or a little up from what you expected, you're going to eat up that clearance very quickly. So let's think about this. 4.3 millimeters, and assume our screw really is 4 millimeters our diameter. So we've got 0.3 millimeters to play with on the diameter. On the radius, we have 0.15 millimeters. That means we can scoot in any direction by a maximum of 0.15 millimeters. That is... only six thousandths of an inch. That's very small. So usually, if I'm getting things machined, I have clearance holes for coarse. And if it's only one hole, where I only have to have one hole, then I'll do this. But anytime, so for M2, you want 2.6, 3.6, 4.8, 5.8, 7. For an M6, you actually have a full millimeter above, and for M8, you have two millimeters above. So anyway, that's just to show you that. Okay, so. Can I extract the screws of these? What screws are those? Those are M4s. The screws you guys are holding are M4s. 4 4.8 millimeter for clearance. Okay. And so this, what should this be? These are the dowels. Millimeters. Okay, so now I'm going to draw here. This is the screw head, and I'll make it black just so it looks well, black. Okay, and so if we were to look at this sideways, this dashed line is just showing us the inside hole. Okay, what are these inside dash lines in this drawing? Can everyone see this? What are the inside dash lines? That's the material and the screw. So when, you, when you're drawing just simple things and you're drawing the screw going through, man, that's a bad drawing. Anyway, um, the, the, these little inner dash lines are the screw and the material. What are the outer dash lines? That's the clearance hole in this plate. See? Let me ask you a question. What would have happened if we had tapped both of these plates and then tried to put a screw through it? It gets jammed up. Can everyone see that? So basically, somewhere in your hole, starting a helix, it's going to start this at some angle theta. So the only way for that to work between the two plates is if that starting, basically the end of one thread and the start of the other, align to a very high tolerance. That's not going to happen. You saw, we just held it up and willy-nilly hand-drilled it in the air for tapping. Tapping is not precision. So you're never, ever, ever tap both plates. The reason I'm mentioning this is in your first lab, which, which by the way goes out tonight, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Wow. Um, you're doing lots of stuff like this. Usually you have a stack of material. For now, let's call it simple. We want to take one plate and another plate, and this is a central hole for a shaft. Doesn't matter what it is. Should we get rid of these dowel pin holes? Should we just use screws? I mean, it's better to use fewer components if we can, right? Fewer holes, fewer things to do. You said no, why not? Because the screws don't align, right? That's what you just said. They yeah, weird. look at your screws. Your screws are at weird angles. It's not a high tolerance. I told you it's sort of four millimeter. 
It might be 4.2, it might be 3.8. Usually they're on the underside, except for the bigger ones. You cannot use screws to align ever. Just as you can't use dowel pins to actually provide real force ever. Basically the only thing, I'm going to write down dowels, are for alignment. Only. Screws are for force. Only. Don't try to align with screws. Don't try to hold together with dowels. Every single time that you are sandwiching things together, at least in our class where we're doing a lot of laser cut stuff, you will use dowel pins for alignment and screw holes for holding it together. Now, why do I have two dowel pin holes and not one? Can you explain? Um, it can rotate one. Yeah. Everyone imagine in your mind that we just have one dowel pin hole, okay? And we put them together, no screws, just one dowel pin hole. Can you all see that the plate will rotate? What's the difference between this dowel pin and a ball bearing, other than that one has much lower friction? There's nothing really keeping it from rotating. In fact, everybody grab the screw, uh, grab the Delrin plate you've got and the screw, grab the screw, and imagine for a second your hand is the press fit into this other plate, just that single constraint. Can you still rotate that plate in your hand? Yes. Okay, grab, grab, the, grab your plate with the screw in it. Now imagine that your hand, you're that second plate, you're that single dowel pin. Now if you can grab, if you can still rotate the plate from your hand, then that means you're under constrained. We need two dowel pin holes here to keep us from being able to rotate. See, let me, let me draw it like this. Can you imagine this configuration between these two plates with only one dowel pin, even though we have holes here? Now if you rotate down so that they overlap, so we have two. Now. If you are machining things out of aluminum and steel, every hole is precious. It takes time, it takes money, and there's a chance to screw it up. You want to minimize the number of holes. Two holes is just fine for aluminum and steel. If you do three, what will happen? Probably not going to fit. It's over constrained. It's like a four-legged table with no compliance. That one's soft, as is uh, plywood. They're not perfectly flat. The steel is much harder. Say you were, were careless with your press fitting with the arbor press to put in your dowel pins, they'll go in at a weird angle. The more holes you have here, say we put one here and here and here and here, the better the chances are it, they'll actually be aligned in the end. This is why, you see what I'm saying? Like say this one got pushed that way, say they all got pushed radially out just a little bit, just by accident, they'd cancel each other out. In soft materials like plastic and plywood, you, more dowel pins gives you more opportunities to cancel out small deflections from improper installation. In aluminum and steel, don't do more than two. It over constrains it. That's why in the homework that goes out tonight, you'll see that I usually have at least three or four, sometimes six dowel pin holes. The same thing uh, with screws is that um, you don't want just two screw holes for things like this. So if you have aluminum and steel, it's fine. They're very rigid materials. Two screws is enough as long as you've gone through the shear calculations to make sure you don't rip the plate in half. But these things are, they're not perfectly flat. You need to force them to be flat against each other. Can you imagine if we had two screw holes here that these two, these two sections would be flat against each other and these two might be bowed outward? Say uh, in the cross section our plates aren't flat, they're actually like this. Every screw we put makes this flatter. If you want a flat circle, you need an evenly spaced um, an evenly spaced screw pattern. Can everyone see that? What, 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 what was this? Okay, so imagine that these two flat plates aren't flat, and they're not. If you look at your downward pieces, half of you have ones that are terrible. Materials don't come particularly nice most of the time. If you want a nice piece of plastic, you're going to pay out the nose for it. So I got you reasonably priced Delrin, and some of it is really warped. It's bent. So if you want two bent pieces to be flat, you have to apply force to them. 
Imagine that we only applied a screw right here. So now our shape is like this. Would that be good? No. So now we put a second screw here. Okay? But as we keep rotating and rotating around, you'll see that parts of it are bent and parts of it aren't. So for me, I always do an equally spaced um, screw thing. So I'll do one, two, three screw holes, or I'll do four, or I'll, or I'll do more. I always do at least three. So the nominal configuration I do for laser cutting stuff is I do three dowel pin holes, and then I do three screw holes. Everybody see that? Are there any questions about this? So you're doing six total? Six total. And you'll see that repeatedly on your homework. Sometimes I'll do four of each. <laughs> so uh, uh, do we do this in aluminum and steel? Why not? Over constraints. This is for soft materials and particularly plastic and plywood that aren't, uh, oh goodness. Compound gear. Thank you for, for prompting me. Everybody see this? Lab one. Goes out tonight. See these two gears? These are rigidly coupled. When I turn one, there's the other. Let's look at it again. We have one, two, three screws. God damn it. And one, two, three dowel pins. Everybody see that? That's because we have a big gear up here and a little gear here, and we want them rigidly coupled. The only way to do that is using dowel pins for alignment and screws for actually forcing them together. Any questions on this? Why do you need to align the gears? I mean, it doesn't matter. Oh, it does matter. Because these tolerances are down to thousands of an inch. Say that we didn't align the gears. Uh, One gear, second gear. That's not going to work. It doesn't make any physical sense. The only way this works is if they're perfectly aligned because I've got gears meshing here and gears meshing here. The only way to align them is with dowel pins. So that reminds me, actually, um, I don't see any reason uh, based on the fact you couldn't see the board last time and the fact that I write all over the board for me going through more of the mathematical derivation in class. Uh, basically, I'm going to videotape myself doing it on the board later tonight and I'll post it. Please watch it. Um, the one thing I do want to call your attention to, we got through everything last time except for this little gear. Anybody know what this gear does? Huh? Idler. So let me, let me just draw that on the board real quick. Okay, so let me make sure we went through all the screw stuff real quick. Okay, and somebody tell me what the self-tapping was all about? Self-material. Yes. For plywood, you don't actually have to use a tap. In fact, if you use, do use a tap, it's probably going to eat up your plywood. It likes to delaminate. So you can self-tap with screws. Plywood is the only material you will ever self-tap in. But the reason it's important is because we're using a lot of plywood in this class. Now, the power tapping, there are two types of tap. One's called a cutting tap, and the other's called a forming tap. All of the rules I'm telling you apply only to the cutting taps. They're the most common. They're the only type you'll probably be using in your careers unless you become machinists. Just know if you do send a plate out and get a machine, there's a good chance they'll use a, a forming tap, in which case the rules are different. You should always ask your guy um, or gal about their tapping rules. Just real quick, the tap is tapered like this, okay? And there are threads on it. 
Why is it tapered? So it can progressively come. So that it has, so it can sort of self-align and start out gentle rather than just jarring it. There are three types. I don't remember all of the names, but basically, it the only they only refer to the the amount of taper. This is called um, a plug tap. This is only for blind holes. So let me draw, uh, and this is uh, very tapered. The second one is just in between. Do you see how the only difference is the amount of tapering? If we have a hole here, okay, so this is a hole and we're tapping it. And this hole is 10 millimeters. No one can see that. Okay, so it's crucial that I have a 10 millimeter hole. In my CAD, I have 10 millimeters worth of threads for my screws. It's a blind hole. What's the problem here? This is called a blind hole. A bl do you know what a blind hole is? So there are two types of holes. A through hole, if this is a plate, a through hole goes all the way through. This is a through hole. This is a blind hole. It only goes part of the way through. Say we're doing a blind. Can I use any of these taps for a through hole? Yes, I can. Now it would be a lot easier to use a tapered tap because it starts easier than the plug hole, the plug tap. Can I use any of these for a blind hole? Why not? Half of them won't be threaded. If I'm relying on getting 10 millimeters of threaded hole and I take up 5 millimeters with just this taper, then it, I'm screwed. You're not really forming true, fully developed threads until about here. Until there's no more taper, the thread is not valid. It's not sufficient. So if, if some of, you know how when I had you guys power tap and you, you saw the, the, the tip of it poke out and you said, I'm done? And I said, no, no, keep going. And you're like, oh, I don't want to keep going. And I made you go all the way to through the end. That's because it was only the full diameter at the very end. Okay? This is real important with the taps. When you pick up a tap, look at it and see if there's barely any taper. It's a plug tap. It's for blind holes. Don't use it for through holes. It just makes your life harder. If you have a blind hole, don't use anything but a plug tap because otherwise um, you're not going to have fully developed threads. When you reach the bottom of the blind hole, stop turning. You're about to break the tap. Okay, I believe, this is, uh, oh, and the last thing was reaming. Uh, reaming only takes very, very little material off of um, a hole. Any of you guys uh, work on cars, rebuilding engines? So you use reamers to, uh, for the engine blocks for uh, the holes where the pistons slide. Very precise um, diameters. They come in every half of a thousandth of an inch, usually. And so even if you buy a metric reamer, if, when you get it, it'll have inches on it. Reamers are in, always in inches. 0. 0.0005 inches is typically a standard increment for a reamer. Um, and so this is important because say you have a, um, an eight millimeter shaft, but you want a press fit, then you actually need to back off by like around a half of a thou to one thou. So that's why they come in this. So reamers are for precision only. If you have an eight millimeter hole that you want to end up with, you use an eight millimeter reamer. Don't start drilling smaller than 7.9 millimeters. Basically, whatever the smallest drill bit beneath the reamer, use that. So if we're doing 7 millimeters, use 6.9. If we're doing 4 millimeters, use 3.9. If you use a 3 millimeter, the reamer will just tear up your material. It'll just look like someone just got a chipmunk in there biting out little chunks. Okay, the center punch is self-explanatory. Uh, but let's go over it real quick. This is your drill bit. 
it likes to walk. This is a point, right? And it's spiraling. So it kind of likes to walk over like this, kind of like a spinning top. Well, that's bad. We're saying we want to drill here. And as we apply pressure and start spinning, it spins over here and drills here. Everybody take out your Delrin and tell me how close you got to the intersection of the two orthogonal lines in terms of that hole. It might be hard to tell now if there's a screw in it. I saw some of you were off by a good three millimeters, which is fine. I'm very proud. None, no one was injured. Everyone did it just fine. You'll get really good at this at, by the end of the first lab, but I had you do it here so I could show you. If you were nowhere close, don't feel bad. If you hadn't center punched, you'd be twice as far. When we make a center punch, it's a little divot here, okay? And then the, uh, the tip of the drill goes in it and it keeps it from wandering away. In, uh, in aluminum and steel, it's called a center drill. It's a special type of drill that does the same thing. It's too hard for a center punch to work. But for aluminum and Delrin, you do this. This is important because in the first lab, you're going to have another piece of Delrin. And this time, I'm going to ask you to turn your part 90 degrees to look at the thin side. And you're going to be drilling straight into that. And it's a, it's a real narrow shot. If you screw it up, it's, you're done and it's pretty easy. So you have to use the center punch to line that up. Okay, so we went through all of this, well done. The reason I went through this information now is so that I could talk about why we're doing various things for lab one. Um, okay, real quick, I'm gonna tell you what an idler is and what a rack is. I have one gear, oh. Say these are all on one diameter, in terms of these were all 15 millimeters away from the center. The term for this on a machine drawing is BC. Anyone know what that means? Bolt circle. So I might look at this and say, um, I have six holes total, evenly spaced, on a 20 millimeter BC, bolt circle. And then I would tell you three holes are three millimeter dowels, three holes are tapped for M4 by 0.7, and they're alternating. It states the obvious, but BC is bolt circle. Okay, so the reason we did this at the beginning, even though it's not contiguous with the gear discussion from last time, is because my helpers needed to go. One gear, second gear. Anyone remember the term for this? Pitch circle. Because it's at the pitch diameter of the gear. Okay, so this is one gear. And now I'm going to put a third one. This is gear one, two, and three. The term for this second one is an idler. The only thing idlers do is change the direction of rotation at the output or give you extra spacing. Say you're constrained in how big this can be. Say you can't go below that line and above this line, but you have to get from this point to this point, right? So if we didn't have this constraint, we could use two giant gears. But we can't go above this height, so we have to use smaller gears. So we have to use more than two. And we're not going to use a belt yet because I haven't taught you about belts. So either change direction or they span gaps. This is an example of spanning a gap. I want to be here and here. They have to be a certain size, so I have to add an additional one. I could add in of these. Say I had to stay within the bounds of this board and I had to get all the way down to that door. I'd need a lot of them, right? Okay. So if I spin this way, this one spins which way? And this one spins which way? The other way. So you can see what direction would the spin if this was gone? Opposite. So it changed the direction. Did it change the gear ratio? And why not? So I will, 
I will write out the math for you later. It's not hard, but here's just a simple way of seeing it. Let's zoom in for a second, just here at this interface. Actually, you know what? Um, this is obvious enough, and we're running out of time enough. So basically, later tonight, I'm going to, because uh, on the video we were like, I was writing down here for the tooth loading. Yeah. Is the gear ratio 3 over 1? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the gear ratio is 3 over 1 as the answer. This disappears because basically, you, you, uh, so here's why. At this contact point, you get a gear ratio up, and at this contact point, you get a gear ratio down. So, um, let's see. So look tonight for that. We're running out of time, so I'm going to go over some administrative things real quick. Uh, each of you should have a giant yellow manual. Is that true? If you don't, get one from the boxes on your way out. They're the giant yellow manuals. Um, Misumi sells a lot of really awesome mechanical widgets. They're coming by Thursday night at 6 o'clock. Attendance is optional because we can't make you come to things that aren't actually scheduled ahead of time uh, for class hours. But I strongly recommend you come. There'll be Chinese food. And basically, uh, my dissertation has 15 degrees of freedom and 90% of the parts are all from Masumi. So uh, if you order from McMaster, they send you a long shaft and you cut it yourself and you sand it yourself and you chamfer it yourself. When you order the same thing from Masumi, it comes pre-cut, pre-sanded, pre-chamfered, ready to go. Their main thing is everything is completely customizable. So you can add chamfers, add retaining ring slots, add everything. It's like, it's like when you go to Subway, rather than, than selecting you know, uh, one, th one permutation of veggies, you get to pick out which veggie you want. It's like, it's like the Subway of mechanical components, only <laughs> it doesn't constantly smell terrible. Um, should we bring the book with us on Thursday? Yes, you should bring the book with you on Thursday. And you'll get more out of it if you peruse through it. At the very front of it, there are just pictures. So you want to start with the pictures. If something looks interesting, turn to that page. If it doesn't, skip it. Um, how many people have done the PRL safety training? Okay, so there are still a few of you who haven't. Please uh, complete the PRL safety training by Wednesday at the latest so that we can actually get you prototyping. Um, some of you still owe me checks. Some of you still owe me uh, Clark Center certification forms. Um, please send those to me tonight, if at all possible. If you have your checks with you, uh, bring them afterwards. If not, bring them Wednesday. Yep. Right here. Sorry. So I'll send out an email about that later tonight. But Masumi, Thursday night, six o'clock, right here. Chinese food. Bring your yellow book. Optional, but strongly recommended because otherwise, I'm going to keep yammering on the rest of the quarter about Masumi page X, and you're going to be like, I never checked my book. This is very confusing. How long? An hour. The Clark Center certification form, is that just a screenshot? Yeah, that was just the screenshot. Um, okay, we have, I'm giving the homework out tonight. Basically, start it right away if you can for the SOLIDWORKS. I haven't completely figured out when the various parts will be due. That'll be on the assignment tonight. But uh, not all of you um, figure, uh, got to do assemblies. We did that the second day, not the first. So I have to do a follow-up SOLIDWORKS training. So what night would you guys like to do it other than Thursday and uh, probably tomorrow? I guess that leaves Wednesday. Can anyone make a, a Wednesday, uh, that's class, a Wednesday evening session? Can I see hands? Wednesday after class. Yes, Wednesday if after class. If you can. Okay, so let's do it Wednesday night. As long as you want. You, can, you don't have to come. It, it's optional. I'm, I'm purely doing it to help you guys do the homework faster. Um, and I'm also, I've now posted both lectures and the first AutoWorks training. We got to the assemblies in the second training. I'll post that tonight. You're free to just watch that if you want. Um, see if there's anything else. So this one is for people who went to the first training? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to send out the homework tonight. It's the first homework I've made. It will probably be buggerific. Mm -hmm. Please post your questions to Piazza. Um, I think I have to add you guys or somehow. I'll figure that out tonight. But basically, don't email me questions because then no one else sees them. Post them to Piazza. 
and you can add yourselves. Okay, so go ahead and do that. I've never actually used Piazza. And um, next lecture, I'm going to insist we don't do anything hands-on because it eats up a lot of time. The next lecture, uh, we're going to go over how you space these gears and what they are. And actually, we're just now finishing up the 3D printing, so we're going to hand out those parts with you. So that'll make a lot more sense, right? Because if I talked about them today and they weren't in your hands, it'd be pretty confusing. So next lecture, um, please bring your bearing shaft with you next lecture and your little spur gear uh, prototypes. Remember we handed those all out? Bring all of those with you next lecture. Uh-huh. Yeah, you, you can keep those. That's fine. So to review, Thursday night, 6 o'clock, Masumi, here. Wednesday night, I'll have to check the room. If you want, here, SolidWorks, probably about... Well, right after class. Um, I guess I can order some food for that. And then uh, homework goes out tonight. Check out the lectures posted online. I think that's it. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we can't do that yet because half of you don't have any type of safety slash access to the building. So the, the pain of this course is getting everyone ready, you know, so you know they don't fire me for letting you in the lab. So um, most of the lab is SolidWorks. So when I send out the homework tonight, you can do you know 75% of, of the lab right away with SolidWorks. And then once we're all certified and have access, we can actually do the in-lab the in part. So it's not, does it still do Friday? The lab? Um, I think the SolidWorks is still going to be due Friday, but then the, the hands-on part will be due later the next week. This and all the gear tooth loading and all the stuff you couldn't see because it was written down here last lecture, I'll do tonight and I'll send out and you can watch it. And you can like either do it at twice speed because it's dumb or you can do it at one speed because I'm confusing. Uh, and what do we bring on Wednesday? Uh, everything I've given you thus far. So the bearings with the shaft in it and the little laser cut spur gears. So we need to keep on this thing too for some reason? Yeah, just keep it. Anytime I hand you something, just put it in your design portfolio so next time you're you know, want to twiddle with it and remember what it felt like. And the reason you have a third hole that's untapped is so you can see what the transformation was from primordial hole to tapped, chamfered, and then reamed. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, now be honest, show of hands. Um, the option was to do all of this stuff in class today or to yammer on about it without having had you do it first and then have you do it next week. Was it more helpful to do the hand tapping and reaming in class before I talked about it? Or would you have preferred to go through gear math and done this next week? This is better. This yeah, is better. Can, better we, yeah. can we see a show of hands so I can actually tell? Okay. Because I, I felt bad talking to you guys about tapping when you had no clue perhaps what that was or how to do it. It wouldn't make sense. Okay, so we'll keep doing this. Thanks, guys. Is there like a scheduled lab time?